Welcome to the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. My name is Jacob Cooper, best-selling author of Life After Breath and the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. For those of you who are new to my channel, we love having you on. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and bell notification icon to stay up to date to weekly interviews and conversations on all platforms coming your way. For those of you who have been here before, we love having you back on. Thank you for coming on and choosing my channel. This week's guest in episode 22, which corresponds to numerology of a master number, is someone who I consider a tremendous luminary and spiritual master in my own um, experience, Jen Weigel. Uh, Jen Weigel is, you know, a renowned spiritual teacher. You know, she runs spiritual social clubs. She is a best-selling author, but she also has a life before this as a spiritual teacher working in Chicago you know, through the Chicago Tribune, you know, as well as a, as an anchor on, on major mass media uh, outlets, you know, and as well as a reporter. And she comes from a legacy um, of family members within, you know, television and media. So she is uh, someone who has really transformed her life on a personal and professional level. So I hope you enjoy my upcoming conversation with Jen Weigel. Uh, I know you're going to get a lot. And without further ado, we welcome Jen Weigel on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Jennifer Weigel, thank you so much for coming on to the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Um, you're my perfect guest because you have so much wisdom and so much to share. I've been a big fan of followers of you and your work, and I know I've been on your platform before, so it's an honor to have you to come here on the channel. How have you been? I've been well. So great to see all that's going on for you. Was having my coffee with your book this morning. So thank you for your wisdom as always. It's great reminders. I, I tell people all the time that even after you finished a book, it's great to keep them handy and sort of use them as an oracle and just say, what do I need today? And then you'll be guided to whatever page gives you the message. So uh, yours is one of my books, especially lately since I knew we were going to have this conversation. So thanks for all that you do. Well, thank you. That That's so true. I was just thinking that last night where I was reading a friend, a book of my friend, um, and she channels the work of, you know, Dr. Wayne Dyer. Mm -hmm. And I opened up to the one of the pages of the book, and it was right then and there. It was a powerful message, you know, channel from Wayne. So mm -hmm. it's almost kind of like a tarot card reading, if you will, where you're yeah. getting the reading of the day. And so I'm glad that you know the book had that profound message. Um, I know, I know you, and plenty of my followers, I'm sure, know you. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your background, because I do a lot of past life regression in workshops, and you're someone who has lived like, like a lot of different incarnations in one, like, you know, I was reading, you have a theater background, you know, you, you did a lot of media, you were an anchor, and now you're just this massive, impactful, spiritual, you know, teacher and channeler. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started onto the shift of your current work. Uh, for a mass media to more of the you know spiritual community. Well, I tell people now that I'm a storyteller, but the platform always changes. Mm -hmm. And so if you have an intention to try to express and tell facts, well, it started out very just the facts, ma'am, you know, as a reporter and a news anchor in the traditional news bucket, if you will, working for the networks. And I spent uh, years doing ABC, NBC, CBS. Uh, there's a station in Chicago, WGN. I worked for them and then transferred into radio and then transferred into print media, that archaic thing mm -hmm. called a newspaper that some people might remember. I had a column called Lessons for Life that I did for several years at the Chicago Tribune mm -hmm. and then was a wellness columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. And so my beat transferred from uh, news reporting to inspirational information because I lost somebody very dear to me. My father died. Uh, my father, Tim Weigel, was a sports caster in Chicago. I, I joke that he was like Ron Burgundy from Anchorman you know, back in the <laughs> 70s. He was very cheesy, very popular, really bad taste in clothes, but was uh, <laughs> passed away uh, at the age of 56. And so I was 30 at the time, and it was very hard for me to understand where he was. So I set on this journey to interview as many people as possible who claimed they had the ability to talk with mm -hmm. the other side because I didn't really believe in any of it. 
And 22 years later, I'm still doing these conversations and interviews. And I say to people, I'm not telling anyone what to believe. I'm just telling you my discoveries and my findings. And I post those conversations or I write about those conversations or I have a podcast about those conversations and they can believe what they want from the information that's provided. So it's up to them what they want to believe. But I think we're all born with an intuition. And I didn't realize I was until I started working that muscle, if that makes sense. Yes, you may you make a very good point that we're all born with this awareness, but mm -hmm. somewhere down the road, you know, it may not be connected as well. And it seems like a lot more people um, just are not satisfied with the trajectory of their lives and they're tuning into a different channel. And you're offering a wonderful platform community for people to find themselves in a non-dogmatic approach where it's very just free flowing and self-discovery and people have the capacity to figure this out at their own pace. So it's very empowering the work that you do, you know, and I think that turns people off from a lot of different belief systems, the force feeding of some of this stuff. And for you, it's a very, you take, it seems like you take a very empowering approach. You do, you get the information, people come to their conclusions. Well, I think too, history was created by storytelling. It was oral history before it was documented in any way, shape or form. And so that's very important to note that even the sacred texts were spoken orally for dozens, if not decades, if not hundreds of years before they were chiseled onto templates, right? Mm -hmm. And then formulated into these books that we call Bibles or, or, or you know, recorded texts. Mm -hmm. And to know that these recorded texts were told through a bias, a filter. We all have it. We watch it on the news every night. You turn on one channel, you hear one story. You turn on another channel, you hear another story. So I always tell people to kind of have that inner GPS discernment about what they're reading, what they're hearing, because your body will tell you if it's true. And I know you know this because of, of your experiences, but it took me a long time to be able to trust that feeling in my body, that stomach ache when somebody was talking to me, realizing later that that to me means warning this might not be true, or this person might be lying to you, or just be aware. There were all sorts of things that my operating system were telling me that I didn't have, I never gave it credit until I started doing this work. And I, and I empower everybody who is in your audience to trust your physical reaction to things because it is your internal GPS telling you to pay attention. That was a really big lesson for me. The value of trusting that inner voice is so powerful. Yeah. Why do you think it is that so many lose that connection, lose that sense of trust? Why do you think that happens to so many people you know, in the world? Well, I think we're distracted. I really think that today's communication world that we're in, and I'm a member of this community in communication, right? I have social media too. I see headlines, I scroll my phone, I'm guilty of it as well. But when there's so much going on up here, it's really hard to know what's going on inside because we're listening to too much that's going on outside. So I, I always remind people that every morning, just like you brush your teeth, you have to surround ground and I say now shine instead of shield. I know Pat Longo, great teacher of yours and, and friend and teacher of mine, talks about surrounding yourself with light, grounding yourself to the center of the planet, and then putting up that shield so that you don't feel other people's pain and take on their stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've changed that now to shine in my mind, because when you've got the headlights on, you turn on the high beams, if your light is tight and bright, so I say in my spiritual social club community. Tight and bright. You have so many good euphemisms. and yeah. Where does this come? You're like, um, I don't know. They just come. Words to words. Yeah. I have a, a teenage son, and so I used to have to rhyme for things to stick with him. So maybe my spirit guides are like, make it easy. They better rhyme or she won't remember it. So right. make your light tight and bright is one that I say all the yeah. time. And when you're flashing the high beams, dark frequency can't reside in that high beam light. So keeping your light tight and bright, keeping that attitude of gratitude, right? Keeping the love frequency, love and above, mm. will help that manifesting because you have to rise up for it to be able to meet you. And mm. a lot of people just want to do their vision board and then be a jerk every day. And then they're wondering mm. why things aren't manifesting. Well, your attitude has to match what you're trying to bring forth. And that is, again, it's science that's what people go, oh, this is weird. No, it's not. It's frequency. 
It's actually science. And when we can wrap our head around that this is science, mm. not just cray cray, <laughs> I think we'd get more people on board with this understanding of shining their bright light, if that makes sense. Yes, no, absolutely. I think it's important to destigmatize all of this stuff and to recognize that it is evidence based. It is, mm -hmm. you know, empirical, scientifically, you know, based. That isn't woo stuff. So I love what you do in adding credibility, uh, but also making it grounded. Now, um, I think what I took away from you was also that it's important for people to have discernment. Mm -hmm. It's so easy when you're in a place of desperation to just fall into the trap of buying into any word. You're looking, you know, it's kind of like you're drowning and you're just searching for something to latch onto, you know? So it seems also that you're someone who embodies the uh, mindset of, uh, you know, just discerning what feels right. I think that's so pivotal. Uh, yeah. Can you elaborate on that discernment piece? Cause that's huge. Well, it's the inside frequency system turning on. So I liken it to the idea of we all can relate to getting in our car and many of us have a car that you push the start button now. So you have to step on the brake and push start. Mm -hmm. That turns it on just like that. So thinking of that as your inner GPS, your intuition can be turned on just that quickly with the intention of pressing a button. Mm -hmm. So whatever it takes for you to think of that operating system turning on, that will then turn on the antenna for your discernment to start working. I'll give an example. I get a lot of texts from people asking because I've sort of become this Angie's list <laughs> for psychics, mediums, healers, because I do so many interviews with people who are intuitive or they've had near-death experiences. And a lot of times, mm -hmm. as you know personally, when trauma happens from an emotional or physical standpoint, it re-rattles the wiring in your brain and can give you an added advantage to that discernment, to that intuition, to that you know that operating system. But I tell people they can work it even if they haven't had trauma. They can still decide that they want to run a marathon. You just have to train for it. You can't just suddenly run 26 miles. You have to work up to it two miles, four miles, six miles. So building your intuition is like that. You're building the muscles. You're using them more frequently. And so I got a text on Friday from somebody, I need a good psychic. Blah, blah, blah. You know, this stuff is going on. And I wrote him back and I said, no, you need to turn on your operating system. You need to get quiet because you're in fight or flight and you're in panic. So you literally have to control, alt, delete your system. Mm. How do we do that? Well, you know this, there's breathing techniques. Just the simplest way, if you are in fight or flight, inhale for two, exhale for four. You have to exhale twice as long as you inhale. Mm. Do this for 30 seconds. It will re- wire your operating system. It will calm you down. It'll get you out of fight or flight. So you can't get any information from anybody outside of yourself or within if you are in panic, right? If you are in lizard brain, as we say. So I just said to this person, I said, no, first you have to calm your operating system, slow your breathing, do this for two minutes and then get back to me. Right? So then five minutes later, I get a text. Okay. I did it. I still need a psychic. <laughs> I'm panicked. And I said, okay, I'll give you the names of some people that are very intuitive that might be able to help you see that, you know, sometimes you can't see the forest or the trees. Sometimes you really cannot. You need someone to tell you when you've got basil in your teeth, right? I get mm -hmm. it. We can't have every answer and it's wonderful to get other people's intuitive insight into your system, get mm -hmm. the macro view. I'm not opposed to that at all, but it's the people that can't leave the house without calling a psychic or can't go to the grocery store without texting yeah. a medium. Like what? No. That's when people become codependent. They turn off their inner GPS and they are not working the muscle as they should. So we have to choose, just like we have to choose to take our car through the car wash. We have to choose to develop our intuition. And so many people want to drive through fix now, Jacob, you know this. They just, yes. want, they just want to just press a button, have it taken care of, and just have someone else do the work. Mm. But the best rewards come from those things we do ourselves. How great do people feel when they've finished a triathlon because they've trained for it for months? Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing and care needs to be mm -hmm. taken with our intuitive muscles. We have to train and work those muscles and choose to develop them every day. Wow. So being your own psychic is a possibility, you know, yeah. and listening to that voice. I think our world in, in general 
you know, on one hand, it's a double-edged sword with this phenomenon. We're exposed to a lot more of this information and mm -hmm. we're a lot more aware, but also it leads to a lot of dependence. You just ask Siri to do everything for you and the room, but to have your vacuum. And so people approach spirituality with that same transactional mindset of external resources to handle your internal uh, situations. And for you, it seems like there's an inner uh, capacity to handle anything that's going on in your life. And you have the power in you from what I gather you're saying. Well, I'm very human too, Jacob. I'll have moments where I'm freaking out too, because I can't see what the GPS has in mind for me. Mm -hmm. But I tell everybody this, if your intention is mm -hmm. to help heal yourself so you can heal others, that's where it has to start. If you don't help heal you. yourself, you have nothing to give. You can't share what you don't have. So heal yourself first, <clears throat> fill up your water, and then you have something you can pour into someone else's cup. But if yours is empty, you have nothing to share. And that is as real as it gets. And so anytime I'm feeling panicked, I stop what I'm doing and I ask to connect to the divine. And how do you do that? You ground, you have to connect to source. And here's another rhyme for you. <laughs> I ask for the flow of the force of source. That force of source within me, I have to fill up my force of source. And how do force I do it? Of source. Yeah, wow. the force of source. Bring the force that. of source yeah. through me and how it's going to flow out of me, but it can't go out until it comes in. So mm -hmm. thinking of that force of source going, boom, filling up your cup. Okay, all right, we're good, we're good. And sometimes that's stopping everything and breathing, but mm -hmm. consciously choosing mm -hmm. to fill up your force of source. I tell people it's like when you plug in your phone, you got to put a plug in and it's in the wall. Same exact thing we're doing with our, with our operating system. You're plugging in from the base of your spine into that force of source, feel it coming in through you. Some people like to picture it coming from above and it can, whatever works for you, but you have to have that grounding cord. Otherwise you're out of sorts. It's really like a boat that doesn't have an anchor just floating mm -hmm. in the water and it has no, it's just kind of going around like, woo. And it's, if it's not anchored, right. there's less power. So mm -hmm. really remembering to anchor. So I have those moments all the time, Jacob, but I tell people, yes, we have to make it microwave ready in a lot of ways or nobody's going to do it. So that's why I think of these control alt delete sort of spirit hacks, mm -hmm. get other people to realize how quickly they can tap into that force of source, right. but they have mm -hmm. to choose it. You have to choose it with your mind. I'm amazed. You know, I, you know, this is, you know, what my 20 something episode, and I did a little bit of digging just to see, you know, I think your sun sign sells, tells a little bit about you, but I saw that you were a Libra. You have, I think October 6th is your birthday, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So yeah, given Libras are, you know, the, I'm a Taurus. We're both ruled by Venus, the planet of beauty, but you know, it's an air sign excellent for the work that you do in your family's lineage of communication, media. Uh, so that's one thing, but I'm also wondering, like, I'm just sitting back and I'm hearing, you know, this rapid fire, incredible insight, you know, and you're so tuned in. Have you always been, you know, that um, tuned in and just, you know, you know, it's, you can't teach what you have right now. I mean, you, you know, it's just, I'm just wondering, have you always been that tuned in where you could come up with all these incredible catchphrases and, you know, sayings. I mean, it is amazing. Where does this all come from? It's, it all comes from source. It, it truly has. I, I have listened now mm. and, it, and it takes intense listening to be able to hear this guidance. Mm. And I'm going to lie. If I think anybody says they have all the answers, they're full of crap. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to just be right. open to what's coming through. And what I have wonderful teachers and mentors. I tell people all the time, it's so important to have people you look up to and you respect mm -hmm. and you treat this as a, a school. And mm -hmm. I have been a student now, a life student, and I couldn't have gone through, I, I had a lot of bumps in the road. I mean, during the pandemic, I had to move. I had to move twice in one year in 2020. Wow. Wow. Six wow. times in seven years. I had, I went from, having a lot and a wonderful job and a huge salary to, to suddenly cutting and pasting and reinventing my life. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't coach people through hardships if I hadn't experienced those hardships myself. And I tell that a lot because I, there's so many people that sit on this high horse of, Oh, I'm a guru and I'm going to give you all this wisdom. And I'm kind of like, well, what 
hardships have you gotten through? Have you watched mm -hmm. anyone die? Have you been terrified about paying your bills? Have you had to feed a child? Have you had you know, all of these things I had to go through to get on the other side of it? So you have to, I say this a lot too, you have to feel it to heal it. And But we all want to just take a pill to not feel it or drink a bottle of wine to not feel it or eat some chocolate to not feel it or shop mm -hmm. because it makes us feel better. But pain is a part of growth. And I don't know any real gurus who didn't experience super painful times in their life to get to be that wisdom person. Mm -hmm. So anything that I have now, Jacob, is just because I wore it like armor, but I didn't dwell on it. I was able to experience it and feel it to then be able to see, gosh, that was really hard. And anybody else who's out there experiencing it, I can totally relate. So no, this came over years and years. And I have some some people that I coach now and they're in their 20s. And I see them really taking everything personally and, oh, this hurts and da 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 It's like, you better get a thicker skin because people are going to chew you up and spit you out. I mean, mm -hmm. and I had a very thick skin going through the media in a very awful Me Too era mm -hmm. where women were verbally abused. We were sexually abused. We were all these things that I, I lived through and see now how awful and inappropriate it was. But I came out the other side of it. And so you have to have some, you have to have some bumps to be able to get that resilience on the other side and uh, not take it all so personally. And that's something I'm seeing happening with this digital age, Jacob. I hate to say it, but people are so like, mm, I'm hurt. My feelings are hurt. This, this is, icky. I don't like this at all. I, 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 I call it the Charmin soft age. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's soft, uh, yes. really. Really? I mean, I, I, I hear, you know, this is a very significant point that you're making because a lot of people will get into that victim mentality where everything is happening to, to me, woe is me, and that's easy on a human level. But it seemed like from your spiritual foundation and your devotion to service, you saw this as so much more beyond you, that your capacity to transcend pain into growth was not just about you, but to be able to have empathy and understanding uh, in your work with others. And so that key component that you brought up, the service component, it seemed to allow you to really, you know, ascend and transcend all that was that was throwing in your direction on a human level. Yeah. And you talked about Wayne Dyer. Um, I really, I interviewed him many times. He was a friend. He was fantastic. And when he would come through Chicago, we would connect. And, mm -hmm. and I remember him just saying, Jennifer, I wake up every day and I say, how can I serve? Where do you want me to go today? And he would read a letter of, of sort of like a fan mail letter, old school, right? And, and, and feel that gratitude that he was able to reach somebody or touch somebody and then say, where do you want me to go? And, and I've interviewed a lot of people who have that uh, Dr. Mary Neal to heaven and back her best-selling book when she had her near death experience. She really changed things for me because as an MD, orthopedic surgeon, for her to be without oxygen for 30 minutes, she knows mm -hmm. she's a walking miracle. She was in the light with Jesus and all of her guides and watching her lifeless body as they tried to resuscitate her lifeless body and going back into the body and feeling the pain and then coming back out of the body. And it's such an amazing experience. And she said that when she really got this memo of ser you know, service, how can I serve? It is truly an honor to be in this incarnation, in this human form. Mm -hmm. We could all just check out and go into spirit. And then we still have to serve from over there. I got news for you. There's homework over there too. Mm -hmm. But to be able to wake up and say, you know, how, show me the signs and the connect the dots. And when you say thank you for every sign you get, Dr. Mary Neal said, that's when they'll happen so often. You wouldn't be able to explain it with the laws of probabilities mm -hmm. and averages and mathematics. It's going to signal the universe that your light is on, your flare is up, if you will. And they're going to be like, Weigel's turned on, send her more signs, you know, and, and, and then boom, they're going to come down and you're going to go, oh, look at that. It's so cool. And so that's another thing I do since Dr. Mary Neal's conversation, I see heart shapes now mm -hmm. in the clouds, in the dog poop. I see it everywhere and it's hilarious. So I'll take pictures, I'll post it on social media especially in rocks. They come in rock form now, but it's just to show me that there is always, always that little wink waiting. If you're open to it, you're never alone. You have a team behind you. Becca Rosen calls it team spirit. 
So your team spirit is always with you. You're born with the guardian angel and an entire team of angels. And if you choose to think of them just because you can't physically see them, some people can. Big props to those people. I, I have such clairvoyant envy. I don't know about you, Jacob, but I'm like, I wish I could see my angels. I don't see anything, but right. I know they're there, right? We know they're there. We just can't see them or I can't see them. Can you? Yeah. I mean, during my ND, certainly in parts through life I have, but you know, it's like when you go to these medium events and you see someone that is up there giving a damn and you're, you know, close friends with them and they're right next to you. Right. And you're like, ah, oh, can I just get into that body for a second and do that? You know, it's like they're giving a point after point. Like sometimes it could be you know, a little frustrating. It's like, how come I can't, and I could connect to like a level, but like that level, it's like point after point after point. Yeah. And the person is like right next to you, you're close with them, you're joking around with them. It's like you feel so connected. And then at the same time, you feel, you know, disconnected or they're like a million miles away from you at the same mm -hmm. time. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's neat. And I love, and that's again, that just goes to show that sometimes you need someone to tell you something that you can't see yourself. And that's what good friends are. And that's what community is. Another piece to this huge thing that happened for me after the pandemic. I used to do live events every month. And then the pandemic hit and I changed this to a Zoom community, my spiritual social club community, where I would have different authors come on and talk about their experiences and, and, and interact with the community. And now we have a membership community where people get together. We meet every week. Some people are so diligent about showing up and doing their spiritual homework. And other people just show up once a, every six months. It's up to them. I, I'm not judging. But when you have a community of people that you know are there and, and have your back and care. Mm -hmm. They care about your journey. They care. You know, there's this wonderful series on Netflix right now that I don't know if you've seen called The Blue Zones. The Blue yeah. Zones. No. Yeah, the Blue Zones are places in the globe where they have more centurions than other places, mm -hmm. people who live to be 100. And the reason they have such longevity is there are several through lines, but community purpose. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have gardens and incredible healthy food that they make themselves, right? But these people are working into their mid-90s with a task, a purpose, knowing that their lemons that they grow are going towards the lemonade that they're making for the entire village. I mean, it's it's fascinating. So I'm so fascinated with it. I'm, I'm leading a trip into the blue zones of Greece next uh, summer of 2024 wow. because I want to take people there so they can feel this community. They can feel feel this connection and this purpose and, and drink that lemonade or maybe lemoncello, but whatever we do, <laughs> we'll do with like-minded others. And, and that makes, that makes it feel like you've got uh, this, this connected family. I have a blood yeah. family that I'm not connected to, but my spiritual mm -hmm. family, boy, am I connected to them. Absolutely. I mean, spirit was bugging me. You beat me to it to just say, Hey, ask Jennifer about community and yeah. the significance of it. And I didn't even have to ask. It was received. Okay. There you go. And so thank you for highlighting that. I haven't heard, I've interviewed a couple, it, that hasn't been highlighted as much as I would like to, just how significant community is, but not just community, but of like-minded people who will get you, who will not judge you. And I know for you, you're all about that. That's very Libra ruled. Is everyone getting along and together <laughs> and harmonization I absolutely love that. And, you know, today's world, especially living in Cosmo areas, New York, Chicago, everyone's in their own box. You walk down the street, there's no connection. That could be soul, just sucking the soul. And I think for you, it's really just taking that light, connecting with others and mm -hmm. seeing how beautiful that is. Because we hear all the time, we are one, but I've never felt more fragmented in some aspects with, with people today. And I think oneness is really about not a cult, but a healthy community of like-minded people who are there to support, uplift, empower, not control and disempower as you see in some other communities. You know. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, my church faith-based childhood was very judgmental, very fragmented. And now I know that there's a lot of purpose in organized religion that I do think there are some very good elements to that. I'm not, I'm not trashing organized religion here. Right. I'm just saying the container that I was raised in, in that package mm. uh, was very fragmented, judgmental and fear-based. Mm. And so coming into my spiritual self and seeing how so many people with a spiritual background wanting to help communicate, heal, mm. um, the, the hell is the people in judgment. They're the ones stuck in a, in a loop, right? And so the heaven can truly be that connectedness to I've got a friend in Reno, 
that I met on Zoom and a friend in Jersey and a friend in Alberta, Canada, and all mm. of these people, some some members from Amsterdam, China. Crazy. I mean, it's crazy. And you're like, okay. And the people in Amsterdam, like my second book, I'm Spiritual Damn It, has this little cluster of followers in Ireland that have found it. And they're like, when are you coming to Ireland? And it's just so fantastic to think that in other parts of the globe, people want to sit and they want to talk about their spirit guides or their intuition that they're developing and, and learning to trust and being being with that like-minded others, whether you're at a bonfire in Chicago, Illinois, or the woods of Wisconsin, or a mountain in Ireland, you can be doing the same thing, coming together with a like-minded purpose and supporting each other. It's pretty cool. I almost find this, that, that that's almost evidential that this is real. Like no matter what your cultural background is, no matter where you are in the world, people are tapping into the same stuff. It may be slightly different, like in some cultures, let's say spirit guides or guardian angels, whatever it is, mm -hmm. everyone you know who's tuned into this stuff is tapping into the same stuff. And it's just amazing, you know, no matter what your background is. So um, yeah, I know you're definitely using today's technology, which is a double-edged sword. It could be very addictive and mm -hmm. that has a downside, but it seems like you're using it for the greater good and for healing and connectivity. And, yeah, that's changing lives. You know, that's what was needed there during the pandemic was the connection. And we're using our tools, what we have today, mm -hmm. you know, to to uh, maximize this. I wanted to scale back a little bit with you and talk on a micro level about your path, because, you know, you mentioned, you know, my biggest teacher in life, Dr. Wayne Dyer. And for those who don't know him, like he was about to receive tenure, you know, I think from St. John's University, right around where I live. And you know, but there was something else calling him and he, you know, mm -hmm. locked himself in a hotel room. And I think he wrote your erroneous zones and he said, no, there's something else. There's another career path. I, I'm not meant to be in academia. Mm -hmm. There's something else. And I look at you in a similar way, like you were in, you know, media, you know, from a lineage of, of your father. You mentioned Tim, who is a legendary sportscaster. I, I don't see the Ron Burgundy reference. I think, you know, he, you know that's funny, but, you know, he was... He's a, he's a legend of his own, yeah, yeah. but, um, you know, but, but I'm wondering like, how did you come to that place? Cause so many people, they talk about their purpose, but they just seem to not have the, I'm not going to say, but the guts to, where did you get the guts to just say, no, I can't do this anymore. I need to shift. And there's something else calling me. Like, when did that happen? And for viewers who are having that itch, how did they get to that place? Well, yeah. so it's interesting. I, I really knew that the news business of it bleeds, it leads was not for me because every morning I would wake up and I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning and be there bright and perky in time for the 5.04 a.m. report. So talk about your circadian rhythm being off. Oh, You're yeah. showering and doing your hair at four in the morning and, and showing up and, and just go, go, go in that competitive, um, negative, mm -hmm. it was really intense it was very, very intense. And, and so it never felt right in my body. Mm. And it took really, and I wrote about this in my first book, Stay Tuned. It really took me getting enough guidance from my dad on the other side, from, mm. from different meditations and different experts basically saying where he was like, I had it all wrong. I was all about ego and job status. And that was the most important thing. And really what's most important is the people you surround yourself with. And you're, it's not about money. You can't take it with you. Everybody just fights over it when you're gone. It's mm -hmm. about quality of life. And the quality of mm -hmm. life is your relationships. And that's really what he kept telling me through meditation and through different intuitive experts that I would talk to. They just kept telling me the same message. They didn't know anything about me. And I was so scared. Uh, the oh. validation piece that you're connecting to this, but also the same message from what you're yeah. saying was also validate and it's kind of like what carl Jung refers to as the morning in life where people are chasing the accolades the jobs the cars yeah then once you get to that point you have a midlife crisis you recognize a cultural myth it is not working and you get into the afternoon of life where it's about the being and the joy and the love and yeah. it seems like that's where you have been at the last several years it has and i can tell you this i know so many really rich people who are absolutely miserable miserable humans. Right. And so money does not buy happiness at all. 
And, I, and I've seen this now again and again. Now, of course, it's important to be able to pay your bills and have a roof over your head and, and feed yourself and your family. I'm not knocking anything like that. We need to have our, our but we also don't realize what kind of a community the people that came together to help me move all those times and to help me, you know, declutter and downsize and, and figure out my next steps, they wouldn't have been able to rise up and meet me if I hadn't said, hey, I need help. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't, they see that as weakness to ask for help. Yes. And, and that is not the case either. So, mm -hmm. so what happened for me was this intuitive buildup, if you will, of all these messages coming in through other sources until I finally realized, mm -hmm. wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe I can activate this within. Maybe the messages that I'm hearing and seeing, and I would use these as a reporter, Jacob, so we, they call it our, our gut instinct, mm -hmm. right? If I knew that there was a lead on a story and I would always be right. And it was just like, wow, you've really got that gut instinct. I remember being hailed for my gut instincts as a reporter and not realizing that was intuition. My gut instincts as a mother, not realizing that's intuition. And so now I'll be coaching with somebody, Jacob, and I just, these things start flying coming into my to, brain. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even know where this is coming from. I'll give you an example. I was talking to this one woman and I got this feeling she was very stuck creatively. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I just right. really feel like you're stuck. And I don't know why, but I'm hearing classical music. So instead of silence to get your ideas, I really feel like you need to be inspired by classical music. And I said to her, like Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, like the classics. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know why, but I am seeing a bust of Beethoven. And she busts out laughing. Sorry, pun intended. That's okay. kind of weird. She literally starts laughing and says, I have in my home a bust of Beethoven carved out in the wall with a big light shining on it. Like, can't make that up. Can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, that was validating. So again, until you say it, I tell people, if you sense it, say it. You mm -hmm. have to say it. You never know how you're going to be used. And if your intention is to connect and heal, first healing mm -hmm. yourself and healing others, you will be used as an oracle. Mm -hmm. You will be standing in line at the airport and suddenly feel inspired to talk to the person next to you about the story you read in the blah, 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 and how it it, that just might change their life. So right. set the intention to be used as an oracle, no matter where you are. And right. you will be used because that's your intention is to serve. Again, get out of your own way. Mm -hmm. And it's not about us. It's about service. But first we have to be okay to be in service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say this a lot. You don't want that really tired airline pilot flying your plane. You don't want the exhausted surgeon doing mm -hmm. your open heart surgery, mm -hmm. do you? No, no, no. So no. Why, is, why is it okay for us to be on fumes all the time? It's not, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. And from following your work, I don't know if it's a New York or Chicago thing too, but also I've noticed, you know, it's whatever, you know, and I'm sure there's filters for us, but you're very direct in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. I think we live in a world where everyone's tiptoeing about what they should say, how it affects someone, but for you, I know you're from spirit because it doesn't seem like you second guess. It just comes exactly through you and not exactly what you want to hear, but what the people need to hear. Right. And it's, and it's a very direct matter. And I, I think that's, that's just what's needed. Um, and yes, you know, it's not like being like going up to someone and giving them a reading. You don't know right. exactly what that person may be going through it. Not necessarily that, but I, I like, I love that about your work now where it seems to be shifting from this macro connection and your messages that you get in your downloads to now where it's, you know, even micro based where someone's in front of you and you're getting all this evidence and the evidential based uh, mediumship. And it's just amazing what happens when you stay in the field and connect to this stuff and how things evolve and unfolds and your gift seems to really be um, expanding. Maybe if you're comfortable talking a little bit about that part, but you know, yeah. I don't know. yeah. Well, no, I really think too, Jacob, it started with animals and this is going to sound really cray cray, but I've been spending a lot of time up at this beautiful horse farm, the Dietrich farm, which is just an hour and 10 minutes from Chicago land in uh, across the border in Wisconsin. And what was happening is, is I, I met this woman named Cindy Myers, who is an incredible animal communicator mm -hmm. who used to be in the Navy. And this is what I love people who become intuitive, but come from a very, like I'm a journalist, right? I won an Emmy for my reporting at CBS. Ho, ho, ho. Okay, great. Who cares? But the point is some people will take me more seriously if I talk about intuition because I had this other life 
right. as a journalist. Well, Cindy Myers was in the Navy working at building radars for the Navy and then noticed that she could get sort of these radar waves from animals. And it started with a baby seal. I mean, it's a fantastic story how she now, she, she had this connection to my dog, Luna, that just passed away, where she would text me, you know, hey, Luna woke me up at four in the morning. She wants to know why it's so cold. And, you know, I mean, it's just like silly things like that, that I never would have believed had I not experienced it myself. So I started spending time up at this horse farm and I would literally get a feeling when I would look at a horse like thirsty. I'm like, I think Liberty's thirsty. You know, like it's just, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Or um, one animal was having trouble with the electric fence. It was actually tripping the water to, so she, so she couldn't go drink it because she was afraid of getting shocked. And I would, I would suddenly be looking and getting these kinds of, so I think that this sort of information can only come in when you're quiet. And I would get that kind of peace and quiet at a farm with no distractions. There weren't enough bars for me to even get a call, let alone be on my phone scrolling. So right. when you're unplugged. You have a I, different kind of Wi-Fi that you connect to and not pay the phone bill each month. That's another. That, and that's it. And right. so I sent my son there for a week. He did a camp there with, with four other 16 year olds last wow. summer and they had no phones during the day. And they, mm -hmm. by the end of the week, they're riding bareback on these horses and wow. they have this incredible experience of connecting back, to nature. So I really encourage people, even if it's just taking a walk for 20 minutes, mm. that's like free, free Xanax right there yeah, yeah. because you're connecting. I, I saw this story. It made me laugh so hard, Jacob. It's called forest bathing and it was in time magazine. Are you kidding me? That's just walking in nature. But now that all these scientists have labeled it right. like a title called <laughs> forest bathing and time magazine right. puts a, a cover story on forest bathing, right. it's like walking in nature. Really? It's, it's so funny how like we, we know we, we need everything to have like a fancy title for it. Yeah. It's, it's as if it's like something new that's never existed, like right. earthing or negative ions, you know, all this stuff is true, but it's just like, it's you know, just go out and take a damn walk. Right? You know, you don't have to like, <laughs> exactly. you don't have to come in like a fancy package or whatever, right. but some people in this today's right. day and age need everything, yeah. you know, fancy schmancy and labeled in a certain way in order for you to kind of go for the bait. But Right. Yeah, it's uh, you want to, you want to call it God's free nature, God's free spa, whatever it is. Just, yeah, it's right just, there. Uh, just and walk. everybody can have it. Look, I live near Chicago and it's busy and it's loud, but I can drive 15 minutes and I can get to a forest preserve where it's not. And yeah. everyone has that ability to find a place where even for 15 minutes they can sit, even if they just go outside. And I do this in my neighborhood and people think I am nuts, but I don't care. I will literally lean on a tree and just think, thank you. Thank you for your oxygen. Thank you for your shade when it's hot. Thank you for the beautiful leaves when it's fall. I mean, literally just putting your hand on a leaf. And you could feel it. Like it goes right from your hand to your heart and it just expands. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. it's amazing how nature yeah. nurtures us mm -hmm. and we breathe it in. They take us in and it's just yeah. a beautiful symbiotic dynamic that we have. Yeah. It, and, and it's free. There, there it is. It's yeah. free. Right, Jacob? That's such a great reminder to anyone out here listening go do that. Or <laughs> somebody said to me, don't kill the bugs you find in your house. They just made a wrong turn. If you made a wrong turn, do you deserve to be killed? And I'm like, mm. Ooh, that's true. They do have a job. So my poor son, we moved in here. There are like 10 spiders that just made mm. a wrong turn and I'm trying to catch them in cups. And my son's like, mom, this is so weird. <laughs> That's that's ve that's very Buddhist to your view. Yes, yes. <laughs> I know. Never in my life would I've ever thought, you know, in my days of being breaking news. You know, I covered 9-11. I covered President Obama's inauguration. I covered right. mayoral elections. I covered so many hard news stories. And now the story I want to cover is whether or not somebody gets on a horse for the first right. time and they have an experience that changes their life forever. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of breaking news I want to talk about. Wow. It's like what Jim Carrey said. He's like, I wish everyone becomes famous to recognize that it's not all that it seems. And it's like, mm -hmm. once you climb that ladder and get to that place, it's yeah, it's not all that. And for you, you're the living proof of it that, you know, whatever you're looking for, you know, that palace is not outside of you. That palace is internally within, as Jesus said, and yeah. you're connecting to that beauty. And it's the small things that are the big things, kind of like that movie Soul on Pixar. If you've ever seen it, it's like that mm -hmm. small stuff that's really... Yeah. The big stuff, being in the moment, you know, the fresh wind, you know, now we have fall coming, the changing of the seasons. It's just, 
you know, living while we're living and living through a depth of what I call the God lens versus yeah. a human lens and seeing the beauty. And, and you're living proof of that. I'm wondering, I, I wanted, and I know for many of my viewers that come to my channel through, you know, hardships or grief, and it seemed like grief really um, was a shakeup of your life and your soul. Yeah. My question is twofold. Why is it, you know, when people, you know, lose a loved one, you know, all of a sudden, do they start really connecting on an intuitive level or start to get interested in it? And yeah. also, how do we deal with grief? Because you have, you know, as you mentioned, your, the, your late father passed, and I'm sure that was incredibly difficult, but it seemed that you found a new sense of purpose in a way uh, mm -hmm. within time from that period. So could you speak you know, on grief from a higher perspective and human level, because I know you have a lot of personal and, you know, spiritual perspective to really give to that. Well, I think grief is, is one of the best teachers that we can have. So there was my father, but then I was married and, and now, and then divorced. We're, we're amicable. We raise our son together, you know, yeah. we're co-parenting, but, uh, we buried his parents and my dad, three of our four parents in five years. So that was tragic. And then I lost my one of my best friends from high school at the age of 50. She just passed from cancer. It was mm -hmm. so sudden. She was diagnosed on St. Patrick's Day and she was gone by tax day. I mean, it was just three weeks. Boom. Mm -hmm. And it was so shocking to lose somebody who was, I. we all thought, the healthiest of all of us. Right. She, was, she was taking supplements and getting colonoscopies when nobody else was even thinking about it or talking about mm -hmm. it. So to lose somebody that suddenly, for me, I, I started down the spiritual journey because I just wanted to know where the heck my dad was. Like, I didn't understand how could he be here one second and then, he, then he's gone. And how could I be getting these messages from another dimension? Mm -hmm. I, I went into this deep dive of the dimensions and everything that was going on with the dimensions. And Again, to me, knowledge is power. So the more knowledge you have, the more you can understand. But the grief part of losing a loved one and going, well, why did this happen? I, I hate to say this, but when you meet other people that have had so much more intense grief. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I couldn't have ever imagine the pain of losing a child. And God forbid, I hope I never have to. And I've interviewed so many people who have. And for them to be able to get out of bed and function mm -hmm. is just a miracle to me. And to be able to interview them and to see, and I see how some people are still stuck in the grief five, 10, 15 years later, and they're not moving. They're angry, bitter party of one, their mm -hmm. table is ready, you know? And then I have these other people who have moved on, written books, they're channeling messages. My friend, Joseph McQuillan is one of them. He's written now two books about his son, Christopher on the other side. He's got a third book in the works because his son comes to him early in the morning, three something. Yeah. You know, this is a guy who just, sells mortgages and you know pays yeah. bills and now he's yeah. i also think of my my first guest on my channel elizabeth Boisson, helping parents heal and exactly. the life that she lives yes and he's very good friends with her and, yeah. and um they do things together all the time so to be able to take your grief and make something of it that's sort of what i did with stay tuned my first book was all just grief about the passing of my father and as a journalist not believing in any of this stuff so i i chronicled the encounters with different people and kept scratching my head going, that's weird. That's weird. And after about 500, that's weird. <laughs> I decided to. There's something to this. Yeah, yeah. There's something to this. And then taking that first book and I did a one woman show called I'm spiritual damn it, which then became my second book of telling these stories on stage to other people who were like, that's weird. That's kind of weird. And, I'll, and I'm coming out of retirement. I'm going to be doing a, another version of that show with all this new material that has been compiled over the wow. couple of decades I've been doing this. And I was just having a conversation about this the other day. My friend is like, well, what about bringing that back? And I'm like, well, I can't bring it back as it was because it's a different journey now. All these conversations have led me to more proof, if you will, mm -hmm. proof that there is more going on than what we could ever understand proof that we're never alone, proof that our intuition can be turned on. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone because I was as skeptical and materialistic and worried about ego stuff mm -hmm. as it gets. And then I decided to say, screw it. I'm so over it all. I want to go talk to trees and catch spiders. Right. <laughs> like, well, it, it almost seemed like that 
was very freeing for you to have that book with that title for many perspectives. I mean, within the spiritual field, it seems like we almost have to be nuns and we just can't say certain words. We have to be perfect. We can't allow ourselves to be human. Right. So with even the, you know, the metaphysical sphere, you know, you're a groundbreaker, you're a pioneer in that regard. And I think you're empowering others to just allow themselves to be human. And, right. you know, you could say, damn it, you could say, you know, just be human, mm-hmm. own it, you know, and not be afraid of who you are and what you feel. I yeah. think with, even within our field, beyond the mainstream, you're yeah. a groundbreaker. You really are. Oh, thanks. Well, they, uh, my they didn't even want to put that as the title because they said, oh, you'll never sell books in the South. Like Arkansas will freak out if you, right. I'm like, well, I don't really care. I never go to Arkansas. So I'm not worried about them. <laughs> not, no offense to Arkansas. It's but not your target audience. Yeah. yeah. If they don't buy, I'm spiritual, damn it, because damn it's in the title. I remember I had it. <laughs> I did a, a damn it. I don't care. Yeah. yeah I was like, forget it. That's yeah. the whole point is that we can say damn it. And God or Jesus or the divine can still follow us along our path and celebrate our victories. I know so many people who were not baptized because they don't have that container. They weren't mm-hmm. raised in that church, but they're not going to an inferno. They're fabulous humans. They just didn't have somebody stand over them, bless them with the holy water and say the right prayer for them to be okay. This right. is ridiculous that we're separating ourselves with this belief system. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to pray as I'm loading the dishwasher. And guess what? I think they're going somewhere and that's okay. Damn it. I'm going to go to happy hour and that's okay. Damn it. And God still loves me. You know, I, I write about in I'm spiritual. Damn it. This woman writes to me and says, you know, I'm raising my child and I happen to have this body. And so I go and I dance professionally. So she, I said, you know what? God loves you. Even when you're hanging upside down on that pole. (laughs) <laughs> you're feeding yeah. your kid you're yeah. not selling crack i think he's okay with it so you One know of the oldest professions out there so yeah yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. do what you gotta do <laughs> yeah yeah and it's hard enough as it is and uh exactly it's amazing how much judgment is out there i think what's important is to discern judgment with making an observation mm-hmm. you know i think there's a big difference i think when you observe you're just kind of stating without a vindictiveness or criticism. You're just kind of stating what is. It's a very, you know, just like a mindful kind of thing versus, you know, judgment. It's it's more of uh, just ripping someone apart and stuff like that. And so I'm wondering for you, you know, you've, you've been tuned into this for a while. And you're someone who's always very honest. What observations, you know, when you take a step back, do you see within the spiritual uh, work that you feel are going in the right way, you know, from people who work in the field and people who practice? And maybe what observations do you really see today that you would like to maybe, you know, have people look at it a little bit differently? Uh, mm. I know that's hard, but like maybe like two or three things for time's sake that you're yeah. tuning into as of late. So I, I really ask people to be honest about their why. Mm. And that's a big thing. So it goes back to intention. Why do you want to write a book? And I'll coach people. I'm a ghostwriter for people who don't know how to write or format a book. And I've had a lot of people, I've turned down the project because their why. Their why is to right the wrong from that bully in third grade or make their parents love them. Or if there's vendettas and all that stuff. Yeah. There's vengeance or ego or I'll show you energy and any project, I really feel that that's like standing in quicksand. You might be okay for a little bit, but eventually you will sink. And so I'm really encouraging people now to do the work to find out why they need that to be okay. And it goes back to this saying, it's like, if I just get everything that I want and need, then I'll be at peace. It's like, Mm. no, if you just get to peace, then you'll get everything you want and need. We're going through the wrong. So true. So true. Right. We have to flip it around. And so that is where I get to people and and, and intention like that. What is your why in everything? Mm -hmm. Even if it's just uh, yesterday, I was driving an hour and 20 minutes away from my home. What was my why to see if a certain venue was good for doing live events? Was it frustrating? Was I stuck in traffic? Was it rainy? Yes. But Mm -hmm. I still I got out of the complaint mode and I was like, I'm doing this for an intention to host an event Mm -hmm. to help people. So I am where I'm supposed to be, even when you're stuck in traffic. And Mm. that's just the way it is. Get out of your complaint. Get out of the woe is me. It's just traffic, right? So it's like, okay. So that's a big one for me is asking the why. Um, 
And then really being okay with how people find, some people love certain gurus that I don't care for. Mm. Some people love certain intuitives that I had a terrible experience with, but I'm like, okay, you've got to go be you. But I, I really say this too, make sure they're in the light. How do you know? Well, what's their why? Do you feel good when you're around them? Mm. Um, Carolyn Mace was one of the best, is one of the best mentors I've had. And um, mm. after her book, Anatomy of the Spirit was one of the first foundational sort of medical intuition. She became this medical intuitive, mm. not, not by her choice. She was just doing her thing as an editor and realized somebody could walk past her and she could see why they had kidney problems. And it's like, whoa, suddenly she's had x-ray vision. This is cool. What a party trick, you know? And she said to me, there is nothing sexy about the light. The light is- Say that one more time. There is nothing nothing sexy about Um, the light. The light is love and grace and peace and calm. If you're in that, ooh, sexy feeling. Now that's not to say that you can't have like sexy love when you're in love and it's in love. But if you're at all in that ooh, seductive vibration, that's the dark. Is, you would see- you call that the ego? You yeah. know, is that like the ego? Like it's trying to go after these shiny things and mm-hmm. climb the ladder. Yes. Exactly. So it's important to have that discernment of the light and the, the ego. Right. Um, but when I take a step back, I notice you make a reference of, the why, which I know, um, you know, Holocaust survivor, you know, an author of Man's Search for Meeting, Victor Frankl spoke a lot about, you know, because for him, you know, it, it determined how he was able to survive, you know, like, what am I connecting to? Why am I doing this? What's there? Right. And so not only our why will help with our intentions, but also as a point of resilience and resolve mm-hmm. to just remind ourselves, why am I doing this? And that will determine, it seems, the how Will I get through this and what will I need to do? Right. You know, so that's, that's, you know, that's a very profound observation that you just made. I really thank you for that. Well, you know, too, the other piece of that is bearing witness. Sometimes you're just there to energetically bear witness to someone else's suffering. And there's no audience except God, the divine. There's no audience. And that is just as epic. I'll, I'll give you an example. There was this story that a journalist was talking about. She was held hostage. She was doing a story somewhere in in the Middle East. It was terrible. And as she was terrified for her life, she heard a child being tortured and she couldn't scream because she was afraid then they would kill and torture her. Right. So from an energetic standpoint, she bared witness. And I'm going to cry just thinking about this as this child was tortured and killed. And Mm -hmm. she bared an energetic witness praying directly to that soul in the other cell saying, I am with you, I hear you, whispering only so she could hear and God could hear, and hopefully that soul could hear, but that that was her job. She knew to just pray and bear witness for that soul. And there was no audience. There was no attaboys. It was just being literally a spiritual presence for somebody else's suffering. Mm -hmm. And that was so powerful. I remember I had to pull over when I heard that on NPR and I was listening to it and it was so impactful. And I thought that is what it's about, bearing Mm -hmm. witness to another's pain. Sometimes even in the Holocaust, those parents that were just holding their children in that Mm -hmm. vibration of calm, like Mm -hmm. I've got you, even if they were terrified for their own life, to Mm -hmm. hold them in that moment and give them a moment of peace and calm, to hold an animal that's Mm -hmm. dying and in pain, peace and calm, just bearing witness. I've really gotten to this point now, Jacob, where I feel like, whoa, that is one of the most incredibly powerful things we can do that is never spoken about because again there's no award for this there's no audience for this it just is no i don't know god works in a humorous and allegorical way and and as you know i had my nde in a playground as a child and you know that's the allegory that we are just god's child in the playground here Mm -hmm. as our brothers and sisters keeper to take care of one another not to push down you know and we're all one. And I think if we're all one, one's pain is not outside herself. It becomes your pain, your responsibility. And I, you know, it's such a beautiful uh, reference that you just made because it's so true. This world is all about the applause, the, the pat on the back, everything. Yeah. When you're doing it when no one's watching, that's when it's real. Yeah. That's when it's true. Yeah. And that's when the divine is your only witness. Yeah. And some call it Jesus, some call, whatever deity you pray to, I believe, under this umbrella of mm-hmm. all encompassing life force 
we all have that yeah. force of source. <laughs> amazing, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. So, so Jen, as I know with most of my uh, guests, we know that there's no ending, you know, but mm -hmm. we're not certain all the time with each guest what's around the corner. I know you mentioned you have, you know, some, you know, retreats coming and workshops coming, right. but, um, you know, what's maybe around the bend with Jen, like anything, you know, up the pipeline, a new book, a new course. Um, and also, you know, how could people, you know, be a part of your Sangha, your spiritual community, you know, find your books, find your work, because I know it's so mm -hmm. significant. And you come out here to Long Island with our friend Pat Longo, and you do a lot of stuff. So tell us, how could we, you know, warm up to this fire that you're creating? Yeah. I would love it. Uh, if people just come to jenweigel.com. There's a tab there for a spiritual social club, which is the Zoom community I talked about. I do live events, as you mentioned. We have a an all souls retreat the first weekend of November that I do every year uh, with my friend, Amy O'Keefe. We've been doing it for six years now. And so uh, there's that. And then also, like I mentioned, the spiritual journey of seeing the blue zones next summer of 2024, come with us to the Greek islands. I, there are so many ways to come on Zoom for just a few bucks or mm -hmm. really take 10 days out and come visit me <laughs> on, yeah. on an island. Um, I, I just like to make all sorts of ways accessible. And that that membership is there for the Spiritual Social Club, too, online. And, uh, of course, the free podcast. Lots of free things. My Instagram is free. My YouTube is free. People can just find it by just Googling Jen Weigel. And I appreciate this platform. Thank you so much, Jacob. It was an honor. Oh, Jen Weigel, you know, a woman of integrity, wisdom, someone who's clearly here for a purpose and the greater good of humanity. I know I thank you from speaking from your mind and your heart and delivering so much today. Is there a last closing statement that you have? I know you've delivered so much and I encourage my viewers to look at this video countless times. Is there one particular, um, I know you have countless sayings up there and that, and that noggin, and I feel the word burning, but is there one particular closing statement that you have for viewers tuning in today? Oh, just everyone needs to stay spiritual, damn it. Have a sense of humor. Because if we don't laugh, and that is true, it's frequency, right? Everything that we emanate out just comes back and matches our frequency. And so if we can't laugh, really, truly, laughter and love, get us to that higher um, frequency. A dear friend of mine, Julie Murphy is a financial advisor and she says, you've got to get to the giggle. So mm -hmm. get to the giggle. And when you can giggle about something that literally like carbonated water lifts mm -hmm. your spirits, truly, literally, figuratively, spiritually. So I know this isn't a big deep thoughts by Jack Handy statement, but get to that giggle, stay mm -hmm. spiritual, damn it. And you will attract more of that frequency to match your happy frequency. It's all like attracts like. So be conscious right. what you're putting out. Love it. Wiggle and giggle. Thank you, Jen Weigel. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for being our honor guest and you're welcome back at any moment in time. Thank I you. I love it. We'll have to get you on mine too. Okay, Jacob? Well, that was a wonderful conversation with Jen Weigel. I really took a lot out of it. She's someone who really has um, transformed and, you know, and just changed her life on a personal and professional level uh, from working with mass media, you know, and in the Midwest to now really helping people out, you know, on a different plat media platform, the spiritual community. And she's someone who lives with, as you saw in our conversation, such integrity. Um, she's clearly tapped in and tuned in and she has a tremendous purpose that is helping out so many viewers. So make sure you continue to, you know, look back on our interview because she dropped a lot of beautiful insights and she's someone who's clearly tuned in. So thank you for tuning in to episode 22 with Jen Weigel. Make sure you subscribe so you get up-to-date notifications as next week on the Wisdom Jacob's Ladder, we're going to be having on author of Conversations with God and many other books, the one and only Neil Donald Walsh. Neil's going to be my honored guest, and I can't wait to interview him. He's had an incredible impact on my life on a personal level, and he's someone that I am just so giddy and excited uh, and inspired to have on our channel here. And I know many viewers will feel the same sentiments. So thank you for tuning in. Let's continue to climb the ladder every day in every way and continue to evolve and expand and grow together. We'll see you next week, and thank you for tuning into the Wisdom Jacob's Ladder. God bless.